evening everyone we have with us today professor r shivakumar and professor tapati guhathakurta i welcome you to the seventh session of the design histories of modern and contemporary india a symposium that uh, imami art is hosting in collaboration with tapati di I also thank our outreach partners JBMRC Kolkata and NIT Ahmedabad. Tapati Di will introduce Professor Shivakumar, although he doesn't need any introduction, and she will also give a little synopsis about his talk today. Welcome, Shivta. Tapati Di, over to you. Uh, welcome to. Our this ongoing lecture series for many who may be joining for the first time today. Um, I know there's been a lot of interest uh, that the series has received, and uh, particularly, I'm very grateful for the very engaging discussions that every session has led to. Um, we moved in this lecture series from looking at uh, the more epistemic concerns surrounding what constitutes design and what may be a usable history to thinking about different genres of design, ranging from the graphic arts to um, folk arts and museums. Over the last two lectures with Rebecca Brown and with Nancy Eugenia, we've actually moved between exhibition and museum sites. Uh, in one case, the Festivals of India exhibition, in another case, the Tribal Arts Museum in Bhopal, looking closely at the place of design within these settings. We are really very honored to have with us today, Professor Shiv Kumar, who's going to take us back to a founding pedagogic site of practice and teaching, uh, which is Shantaniketan and Sriniketan. Uh, he'll be looking at the engagement of crafts in these two institutions during its early years, looking at the ways they function together in collaboration and coordination. So the talk is therefore looking at, as we said, titles, two parts, one horizon. Uh, as Ushmita said, Shiv Kumar perhaps need no introduction to this audience here. Uh, he is one of the most reputed art historians, curators, and authors in the field of modern Indian art in India today. Uh, his writings have ranged from uh, the histories of Shantiniketan. Here, a landmark book is Shantiniketan, The Growth of a Contextual Modernism, which accompanied, again, a landmark exhibition of four Shantiniketan artists, uh, Robindranath Nandular, Ramkinkar, and Vinod Bihari at NGMA. Uh, he's been part of, again, another landmark event, which is The Last Harvest, Paintings of Rabindranath Tagore, a book and a traveling exhibition, which was shown in nine major museums across the world on the 150th birth centenary of Rabindranath. Uh, the book that I've benefited from most is, of course, his paintings of Rabindranath Tagore, which brought the artist and his works into a public domain with a detail of analysis and uh, documentation that was truly pioneering and was followed by another similar book also brought up by Pratik Khan by Gaurindranath book on Gaurindranath. He's also very well known for the exhibitions he's curated of K.G. Subramaniam and the writings that have grown around them. So this is just mentioning some of his many wide-ranging fields of scholarship and writing. He's been a professor of art history at Kuala Bhavon, where he was no doubt 
uh, absolutely seminal figure. And he retired from the post very recently at the end of December. I'm sure he is greatly missed by students and colleagues at the institution. And uh, on on the day of his retirement, if I'm not wrong, he was awarded the Zaino Labedin uh, Special Artist kind of felicitation. So welcome, Shubh Kumar. Uh, uh, you can share the screen or begin. You have around uh, maybe 45 to 50 minutes. You could go on a bit longer, of course. We'll all be delighted to hear. But uh, And then we'll open it up for questions. So... Thank you, Sapati, for this invitation and uh, the very kind introduction. Uh, well, I will try to keep to the time. And if I overshoot, please kind of uh, uh, kind of warn me. And if we have time at the end, I am going to speak. And if I we have time at the end, maybe I'll show you a few slides. But uh, that is secondary and so i oh please don't first... watch the slides we'll have the time for it okay anyhow so the the first part of what i'm trying to say is largely factual little bit of the history part of it it's uh, necessary to arrive at some of the conclusions that i would try to make at the end so the first part you will, most of you at least, will know many of the things that I'm going to refer to. So please bear with that. So I'll start with Kalabhavan, which as you know, was founded in 1919, uh, two years before Vishabharati came into existence. And uh, Nandalal was the central figure in this art institution. He left a very enduring mark on the nature of the institution, uh, but it didn't begin immediately as in 1919. It took a few years because Nandalal left Shantaniketan soon after joining. Then he came back. And meanwhile, Ashit Kumar Halda was the, heading the institution. So he sort of comes into his own around 1922. So that is where the engagement with crafts begin. Um, now, it, you can see that when Vishabharati started and when Kalabhavan's first program was announced, it was just a couple of lines. And it said that the department would teach Ankan and Kalpana. These were the two words. I mean, there was hardly just one sentence that these are the two things that the department would teach, which we can roughly translate. I mean, in terms of maybe there was a stamp of Ashit Kumar on that and the Bengal school. So maybe we can roughly translate it into representation and visualization. That might be the literary translation, but in artistic terms, that is probably what it meant. Or visualization could even extend to mean composition. So it was basically fine arts as we called it then, that was the subject or concern of uh, Kalabha. Now, in 1921, from another little note which was published, we know that the course is a little more defined now. It reads the course to be followed in this department is of no less than six years. So in fact, it began as a six year course. And then by the forties, it came in down and it became a four year course. So initially it was a six year course and it will be divided into two parts. The first being for general efficiency and the second for higher proficiency. The instruction in drawing and painting is given here according to the Indian School of Art. So in 1921, that Indian School of Art was still uh, underlined. So that was also the year that, I mean, Vishwabharati was founded and then Kalabhavan becomes a part of Vishwabharati, one of its first department. The other department was the Rural Development Program, which was established in Sriniketan. So both of them 
have a special position within uh, Vishwabharati. And the year 1922 was very important for several reasons. Uh, that was the year that Stella Cranbridge begins to lecture on Western art in Kalabhavan. It was the year of the Bauhaus exhibition. So there is a definite opening up uh, towards other cultures and traditions in that year. And three, that was the year in which printmaking was introduced. Uh, in Kalabhavan, largely lino cuts and wood cuts with the help of Andhra Karpele, who was there. The same year, there was also another little institution or a department or workshop, what we call it, Vijitra. That was in, again initiated. It's the same name as the Vijitra Club that functioned in Jorasango, but this was in Shantani Ketan. It was initially announced as a new department of Kalabhavan, but it was more or less an independent craft workshop. And that was initiated again, largely by Andhra Karpele and Pratima Devi. So you can see that there were also others, other than Nandalal, who were instrumental in initiating the practice of crafts in Shantaniketan. Now, the people who worked there were largely students of Kalabhavan because it was not in Sriniketan, this was in Shantaniketan, and it was closely connected with Kalabhavan. Now, uh, besides Nandalal, uh, who had a very early interest in the folk arts and crafts and so on, even before he came to Shantaniketan, although he made it part of a pedagogical system only after coming to Shantani Kedan. Besides Nandalal, there was Pradima Devi who introduced various things to Shantani Kedan. Uh, here, in this case, she is bringing up book binding and pottery, which she had learned during a visit to Europe uh, with Rabindranath, I mean, I think the previous year. And then later she would study fresco painting and introduced that, which would be later picked up by the artist of Kalabhavan. And similarly, Radhintranath would also be involved in bringing various crafts to Shantaniketan, especially leather batik and woodwork. Now, the magazine which preceded the Shantaniketan newsletter, which was Vishwabharati's first newsletter, which was called Shantaniketan, in April, around April 1923, it had a little write-up on Vijitra stating what were its aims. So the main aim of this workshop was to make our ashram the cradle of a new decorative art based on Indian traditions, but suitable to the new ideals of modern life. So that was its main aim. Then it listed a few other goals. And these included the revival of traditional arts and, I mean, the effort to keep their creative possibilities alive, to establish cooperation between artists and craftsmen, to prevent separation between arts and crafts, to spread craft practices to nearby villages and revive home industries and dying village crafts and improve their earnings, to provide village craftspeople with new designs and utilize their skills to open up careers in applied art for art students and opportunities in craft training for rural women. So in fact, you had a very detailed discussion about uh, Sathya Thre, uh, when and that he didn't have a kind of formal training in uh, kind of commercial art, but you can see that within the program, there was an idea that it should also benefit such students. There never was a proper, I mean, uh, commercial art course, but some elements as we'll see were there. The statement further says that Vijitra's products included artistic book binding, embroidered household requisites like bags, cushions, furniture, book stands, screens, wooden toys, etc., and various decorative objects in lacquer, terracotta tiles, and mural decorations. They also announced that the services 
of Vijitra would be available if somebody wanted to make murals elsewhere or design jewelry. And these products were initially sold locally, but they were also sometimes exhibited, for instance, uh, when the copies of the Ba murals, which Nantala, Ashit Kumar, and Shurin Kaur had made in 2021, uh, I mean, 1921, was exhibited in Calcutta. There was also an exhibition of these craft objects there. So Vijitra was very short-lived. It was closed down within, I think, two years, but many of the ideas which are articulated for the first time in this little write-up on Vijitra became part of the art pedagogy at Kalabhavan and became also the foundation for the craft program under the industries department at, Shant at Sriniketan. Now, right from the beginning, Kalabhavan is organized as a studio-based art program, but new elements are constantly added on. Initially, the the focus was on drawing from nature. That was a new thing, which was not in Calcutta. Then stage designing, alpana, and mural painting were added. Then for this, they also brought in other people. Dantalal, for instance, began by the project by bringing in Narsingalal Burma from Jaipur. That was in 1928. And subsequently, there were traditional folk artists and craftsmen who were invited to Kalaban to demonstrate and to work. So along with the decoration of various venues for various functions with Alpana and designing costumes and for the theatrical performances and floral ornaments were made for the seasonal festivals and so on, these were added gradually. And by the end of the 20s, we can see the whole spectrum of these things. Leather pathic and other textiles came in also towards the end of the 20s. This was Nantalal's method of expanding uh, the art craft spectrum within the framework of Kalabon and getting his students interested in bridging the gap between art and craft. By the end of the 20s, all these activities had become part of the formal training of Kalaba. Now, we can see that by the 30s, this is all put into the syllabus. The 1938 prospects, for instance, says, I mean, that the teachers attend to each student individually and guides and instructs him according to the latter's imaginative bent and his capacity. Great stress is laid on nature study, fresco painting, relief work, I mean, sculpture in the round, and students also have to take active part in stage decoration, in site decoration with Alpana, etc. So these are all now officially part of the program. A further detailed breakup is also given. And it says the course includes freehand drawing, still life, nature study, painting, copying, enlarging, and reducing. Now, these are things that commercial artists would need designing, ornamental drawing, fresco painting, clay modeling, terracotta, linocut, wood engraving, etching, architectural drawing, wood block printing, artistic leather work, and batik. Now, in 1948, you have a prospectus which further breaks down these, the course into two parts, which says the main and technical subjects. The, the technical subjects section has two parts again, which is compulsory and optional. The main subjects are original painting or original modeling. So there's an option there. Freehand drawing, nature study, decorative and ornamental work, copying traditional painting, knowledge of clay modeling, etc. The compulsory technical subjects include wash painting, brushwork, which should be considered as calligraphy, then tempera painting with different media and materials, mural painting in the wet process, agenda process, and egg tempera, also lino cut and wood cut. The optional technical subjects include colored wood block printing, needlework, batik, artistic leather work, alpana, elementary architectural drawing, stage and festival decoration, and knowledge of teaching. And each student has to choose 
free from the optional group. And so a certain flexibility is brought into the course that the students have a choice now. Besides the students would also avail of other kind of training. For instance, they could avail of training in music, study languages, and also study other handicrafts without additional fees. And in, until this period, there is also a certain other aspect that the fees for the girl students is slightly lower than the fees for the boys. After it comes, becomes a central university, besides a little more elaboration of the practical subjects, artistry is included into the coursework. And it includes quite a broad kind of thing. It includes appreciation and appraisal of aesthetic value of various systems of aesthetics, art as cultural expression, and forms determined by patterns of life, study of primitive, religious, and folk arts, etc., as well as history of Indian art from the earlier to the present, general history of art of greater India, China, Japan, Middle East, Europe, and pre-Columbian America. So this was how Kalabon progressed, in a sense, as a teaching institute, and its programs changed. Now we move to Sriniketan. When the Institute of Rural Reconstruction was founded in 1921, Srinikathan was surrounded by malaria, by malaria-stricken villages, steeped in poverty and decline. The objective of the Srinikathan project was not only to pull these villages out of poverty, but also to bring joy into their lives. In Rabindranath's words, the object of the Institute is to bring back life in its completeness to the villages, making self-reliant and self-respectful, acquainted with the cultural tradition of their country and competent to make efficient use of the modern sources for the improvement of their physical, intellectual, and economic condition. So it's just not economic. It is also to improve their intellectual and economic and physical conditions as well. In fact, when Gandhi was thinking about, I mean, the crafts and the rural thing, there was this little correspondence letter that Tagus sends to him saying that it is not merely economic, the poor villagers, I mean, also needs happiness. And uh, that they, the enjoyment of arts is also essential for them. So Srinigadan itself was to serve as a model a nucleus. The real work was in the 76 villages spread across 200 square miles around Sriniketan. And the work has to be carried through a cooperative endeavor. And the focus, the main focus was on 26 villages, which was in its immediate surrounding. And these 26 villages were identified for intensive work, which has to be supervised by the staff and students of Sriniketan. To achieve this, the institute was divided into different departments, and each department focused on a different area. Thus, there were, was a department of agriculture that ran a model farm along with sericulture, dairy, poultry, etc. And the idea of, I mean, transferring scientific knowledge from lab to farm was the guiding principle in this department. There were other departments that worked towards flood control and soil conservation, setting up cooperative banks, fighting malaria and establishing health services, running libraries and night schools for men and women, reviving rural cultures, sports and festivals, undertaking comprehensive rural surveys, and providing artisanal training to villagers and setting up marketing facilities for them. So there were all these different sections and different works they were supposed to carry out. By 1928, for instance, there was a cooperative bank in Shantaniketan, which had 226 credit societies under it, 69 irrigation societies, and 12 
health societies. The crafts fair thus a part of a larger program for the economic and social resurgence of village communities. And it came under the purview of the Department of Rural Industries and Shrikashatra, the school which was founded in Sriniketan. And these two sections worked in Canton. The school was first founded in Shantiniketan and then transferred to Sriniketan. Its main purpose was to educate village children. Besides providing basic education, it also provided training in various crafts like weaving, carpentry, and book binding and leather work. It also taught gardening and health and sanitation, general management, sports, games, and Boy Scouts activities in the villages. It had carried out various educational trips for the boys. It had a literary, ran a literary society and brought out a monthly magazine. And the aim was to create future leaders for rural reconstruction from within the communities. And each student had to choose one craft and the training was pretty comprehensive. Prem Chand Lal, who taught there for some time, he has written a book where he records what is normally, what was the coast like, he says, each craft is considered as a project and treated accordingly. Each project is further divided into units of work according to different process of the particular craft. For example, in weaving, the different processes such as linning, carding, spinning, and weaving of different clothes are considered as units. Along with the practical training, the students were also taught the history and evolution of weaving industry, how that transformed human life, for instance, where the materials came from, I mean, where they can be found in India and where the marketing takes place, how it takes place, where things are imported from, exported to, and things like that. So it was a comprehensive course. It was just not teaching them the vocational part, but also giving them a certain a theoretical understanding of the whole process. The objective of the Rural Industries Department was to develop craft as a secondary activity among the villagers and improve their economic condition. The school was immediately connected with it and formed part of the extension activities of Srinikaran. So these two sections, the school, Shrikashatra, where children were trained, to become future leaders in a similar project, and the Rural Industries Department, they worked together. The immediate effort of the Industries Department was to revive old crafts that were prevalent in the area, especially weaving and tannery. It, the records tell us that in the not so distant past, in Virbhum, there were about 6,000 weavers and 20,000 tanners or cobblers, mochis, as it is written. The first effort, therefore, was to revive these two I mean, crafts in and retrain villages in Sriniketan in weaving and tanning and leather crafts. The Vishwabharati Annual Report of 1922 tells us that weaving, tannery, and carpentry and smithy have been started, and they are in a fledgling state. A year later, we learned that cotton weaving, silk weaving, dairy weaving, calico printing, woolen rug weaving and wig making, uh, straw mats manufacturing, making of carpets are all being done in this, the weaving section, which besides training local villages is also providing them with materials and improved designs and helping them with marketing. So within one year, the work seems to have progressed a bit. We are also told that local village boys are taking advantage of the training offered to them and experimenting with dyeing with deshi dyes. That the quality of the local leather, of course, was found to be not suitable for doing certain kind of thing. So uh, some people are being sent to Calcutta for training uh, in the leather research institutes they had there. And these trainees are also given a little stipend. In 1925, 
Besides the weaving department continue its work as before, experiments are undertaken over block printing, goldsmithy, embroidery, but all this is done without too many external experts to help. The training in tannery and leather works is continuing and saved by then, about, that is 1925. There are about 200 local trainees in this area. And there were also trainees who were being attracted from elsewhere. And so it speaks about one each from Madras and Burma who came to Sriniketan and got trained and went back and started their own enterprise. In the four years since its inception, the weaving section we learn has trained about 138 villagers. And then uh, four years later in 1929, this number goes up to 214. And the training is given in different areas. And we are told it's in spinning, cotton and wool, tape making, carpet making, dari and asan making, weaving, cotton, silk and wool, dyeing yarn and cloth, printing, freehand drawing, model drawing, design making, analysis of cloth. A section for lacquer work, artistic book binding and pottery, and leather embroidery is also started. And experiments in style making is underway. Next year, that is 1930, we are told that the experiments in the manufacture of leather articles, such as handbags, sandals, portfolios, cushions, and embroidery works, etc., is successful. So they begin to now market these things. And also, Batik is introduced by them. Now, in 1930, early 1930s, we saw that Swedish looms are brought into Shantaniketan. And also, small, semi automized Japanese looms are introduced. Two Swedish weavers, they come and spend a near reach in Shantaniketan in 1934 and 35. The Swedish link was activated by one of its ex-students, I mean, Lakshmeshwar Sinha, who was an early student at Sriniketan and went to Sweden and also got trained in the Sloyd system, which is then introduced to Sriniketan, especially in Shikashatra from 1932 onwards. He becomes one of the Sloyd experts in India. And the Japanese looms were introduced by similarly with the help of another of its trainees and teachers, Mahendra Sen Gupta, who Mahendra Chandra Sen Gupta, who was sent to Japan for this purpose and got trained there. Others were also sent elsewhere. For instance, Heman the Sarkar, who was working in the weaving section, is sent to Dartington Hall in England for getting trained in weaving. Sandosh Banjo, who is also Nantalal's son-in-law, he's sent to Lucknow and Jaipur for learning enameling. And Boydanath Ghosh is sent for training in dyeing to a commercial establishment in Calcutta. So you can see that 30s is a point, early 30s is a point that where many of these artists are moving out to get trained in these areas of specialization. In fact, some of the Kalabon students also go up. The most important for the craft thing would be P. Hariharan, who went to Japan, studied uh, pottery, came back to India. Uh, he didn't make a name as an artist, but he was in, very much involved in setting up some of the early pottery, government-run pottery units in India. One in Kerala, others in Karnataka, and then he started helping villagers with things like that. So somebody who did a lot of work at that time, but, but he was now nearly forgotten. Now, by 1934-35, we see Batik work is going on quite strongly. There is also introduction of goldsmithy and minakari, embroidery, needlework, and toy making. That is being added to the thing. Ex-trainees are now working from home, and they are given materials as well as designs and they are paid at piece rate for the work. And that is being marketed by the Sriniketan um, Cooperative. By 1933, 
There's the first illustrated catalog of the craft products is produced. And the products are exhibited in Calcutta and Bombay, especially when there is a Shantaniketan function in these cities, like the Tagore Week in Bombay, for instance. But it is also sold through other stores, like the Bengal stores, the Bengal home industry stores, and the international store in Calcutta. And also, they gradually built up contacts with other stores elsewhere. In 1936, it was these works were exhibited in the Lucknow Congress, along with the works of Shantaniketan artists. Nandalal was in charge of that exhibition. And they were also sent in 1936 to the new Education Fellowship exhibition in London. The 30s actually saw two contrary developments. On the one hand, the need for organized marketing was I mean, seen as necessary to sustain the growing number of craft workers who had received training at Sri Niketan and were working from their homes. And the, from the Vishwabharati annual report of 1934, we learned that workshops of weaving, book binding, and other crafts are being conducted on, quote, business lines. Crafts and weaving sections are separated at this point for better administration, and weaving is extended to more villages around Shantaniketan. They were given yarn and design, and the finished products, as I said earlier, were I mean, sold but bought from them on piece rate basis. In 1938, Sriniketan opens its own emporium in Calcutta on Convalis Street. Interestingly, interestingly, it was opened by Shubhash Chandra Bose. I mean, because this is also a centenary. But it was also being sold through other agencies in Calcutta, Bombay, Nagpur, Delhi, and Darjeeling. So the marketing part is expanding quite a bit. The, we have record of sales from 38 to 40, which show there was some gap between the cost of production or the total cost of the Srinagar and establishment and the sales. The, some of the costs should have gone towards training and paying the stipends, et cetera. Of the total income, about 50% was given to the artist. So that is after minusing all the uh, cost of production. What was left went to them. However, this also meant that production became more market-driven and textiles, crafts, and carpentry gained greater focus. Of this, carpentry was largely used by Vishwabharati itself to meet its internal needs. And most of the time we saw it just broke even. There was no, it was like a no profit, no loss business. The annual report of 1940 informs efforts are being made to standardize and regulate production in order to meet such assured demand and also to eliminate lines of production which are uneconomic. So we see that marketing also puts a certain kind of pressure on the kind of work you do. The shift and its danger is noticed and commented upon by Radhin So in, the, in his 1941 address to the annual meeting at Sriniketan, he says, Sriniketan has always stood for experiment and progress. It will be fatal if any day we settle down and be satisfied with a fixed program of work. If we sacrifice the dynamic ideal of our institutions for stability and security, we shall no longer remain pioneers but gravitate towards mediocrity. I do not deny there has been considerable progress and achievement at Sriniketan during the last 18 years. To those who have been with us and seen the institution grow, I appeal for a closer understanding, a mutual confidence, and a will to pull together. So, one can feel that he feels that everything is not going together, or I mean, going all right in Sri Nikita. And we have, I mean, Hans Newman, uh, Newhouse. He's a Newhouse is a, I mean, there were two brothers. Hans and his brother worked the German porters who used to work in Java. Then they shifted during the World War to Shantani, the end of the World War, and worked there for a few years. And they were in charge of the pottery section. So he, 
actually presents a picture of decline there. According to him, the link between the art school and Sriniketan had broken down. There were not enough trained craftsmen in that pottery section. He had to begin anew with unskilled women laborers, mostly Santals, and the only trained potter in the department was not good enough. However, after some effort, he says that they did manage to produce sellable ceramic toys. The decline in the pottery section could have been due to the lack of market demand. Similarly, paper making and basketry was never really developed and promoted in a big way, although we hear that there were small efforts in this direction. These were perhaps victims of market-led craft development, which begins in the 1930s. In one of the earlier lectures in the series, we had encountered this problem. When you have market-led kind of development or market-led craft production, there can be certain kind of problems that come up. Even as training and production became market-driven by mid-30s, the 30s also was a period of Srinikathan's growing influence. We can hear, for instance, in around 1930, the chapka and takli are introduced, uh, and the yarn produced by the villagers are turned into saris and dhotis for free in Sriniketan as part of the nationalist project. On the other hand, it also acted, the Sriniketan uh, experiment also acted as a predecessor to Gandhi's speech for the revival of village crafts and setting up of all India Village Industries Association in 1934. Gandhi had visited Shukka Shatro in 1925 and he was greatly impressed by the work that was being done. We all know about Nantalal's I mean, engagement with the Gandhian project, about the exhibitions he put out at Lucknow in 1936, which I refer to where he also took crafts. And then again in Five Spur at the end of 1936, where he actually made a collection of folk arts and objects of daily use, which were produced by villagers around the, the session site and showed it, which actually in the inaugural address, Gandhi refers to and say how with an artist eye, he picked out things which would have been missed by others. And also in 38, we know the more famous Harikura session. Similarly, around the same time, Surendranath Kar was called in to design the Magan Sankrahalai or the Museum of All India, I mean, All India Museum of Industries Association at Warta. So there were other links with the Gandhian project. And in December 1937, an article on mass education and vocational training, I mean, written by Lakshmi Shushrinna, was, who was, as I said, a, a student in Sriniketan and later a teacher. This was noticed in the Harijan by Mahadev Deshai. And soon afterwards, Gandhi called him to help him with the implementation of the Vidya Mandar scheme in Vardha, that is in 1938. And he was also involved later, he continued to stay in Vardha and help Gandhi. And he was involved in the formulation of the Nayit Talim educational scheme and wrote a teacher's handbook for educational crafts as part of that program. Lakshmeshwar Sinha, Sinha, I mean, actually was an interesting person. He was also an Esperanto expert and translated Tago's works into Esperanto. So he had many, he wore many caps. Now, similarly, Devi Prasad Gupta, who was a student in Kalabon in the early 40s, joined Sevagram in 1944 and took charge of the art section. We know that later he went on to become a well-known potter and a pacifist. And after independence, although for a short while, Sriniketan was consulted on various government projects, it also began to slide down in its activities because there were other government institutions that took over. So in the annual report of 1948, Radhintranath concedes as much. He says, owing to the difficulty of producing raw material, of procuring raw materials, the Shilpa Bhavana has failed to maintain its wanted 
record of progress and production. Its comprehensive and scientific scheme for the training of young men in rural handicrafts will, if worked out, go a long way in fulfilling the hope of the founder president for a revival of indigenous industries as a first step towards a happy and humane life in the country, in the country of countless villages. In spite of the fall in output, an amount of money has been invested in effecting improvements and installing labor-saving machinery, especially carpentry and pottery works. It is needless to say that the Shilpa Bhavan gives more importance to the creative and educative rather than the commercial aspects of the arts and crafts. Clearly, we can see that there was a tussle between the creative and the commercial aspects, and that was never resolved. Incidentally, it was Radhin I mean, through two reorganization schemes in 1934 and 38, who pushed for Srinigadan to adopt a business model and improve its marketing. After independence, it lost the reformist scene and innovative flexibility of the early years and succumbed to bureaucratic rigidity and inertia as Bishop Bharati did at large. The Srinikan project as a whole, however, achieved its goals. I mean, not just the craft project, but its total, in its totality. A 1959 survey showed that in some of the villages in which the project was implemented, literacy among both men and women was close to 100%. And the children were all going to school. These villages, which were in the grip of, under the grip of money lenders in 1930, had freed themselves using the cooperative credit societies. Their per capita income in 1959 was almost twice that of nearby villages, which were not part of the project. The villages which were part of the project were also largely self-governed. They managed their own conflict resolution and enjoyed better health and material conditions than their neighbors. So in a sense, whatever happened to the craft project, on the whole, the Srinikadam project was a success while it lasted. Finally, although Kalabhavan at Shantinikathan and the industry section in Srinikathan were distinct administrative entities and had different objectives, during the first 30 years, there was continued contact between them. Besides Nantalal, Vinayak Masoji, P. Hariharan, Indusudha Ghosh, Gauri Bancho, and Suhmai Mitro, who were all Kalabhavan ex-students and later some of the teachers were directly involved with des the designing program at Srinikedan at different times. Thus, although the two spaces were distinct, they functioned in a complementary manner. And the ideological link between the two goes back to Rabindranath's days in Shilaidaha, where he first thought of bringing the arts, education, and rural reconstruction together. I shall end by looking at their differences and complementarity very briefly of these two spaces. Okay. Now, Shantini Gedan, you can see, and Kalabon, uh, I mean Kalabon by Shantini Gedan largely, was a space where East met the West. Srini Gedan, on the other hand, was a space where city met, met the village. And Shantiniketan brought crafts into relation with fine arts. Sriniketan brought crafts into relation with other productive rural economies, especially agriculture. Shantiniketan saw crafts as part of the art craft continuum. Sriniketan saw crafts as a category by itself. Shantiniketan saw the craft art continuum as divided into segments linked by a common thread of aesthetics and visual language, separated by function, Srinikedan saw each craft and practice it in isolation. They saw it separate and practice it in isolation. Shantinikedan aimed at producing artist craftsmen and artist designers. Srinikedan aimed at producing artisans 
skilled in single crafts. Shantani Ketan created objects, dis, objects designed and produced by the same person. Srini Ketan produced objects design, based on designs provided by artists and executed by trained craftsmen, a number of them. Production in Shantani Ketan was personalized and the objects were singular objects. In Srini Ketan, they produce mass produced objects from chosen models and for the market. In Shantinigadan, craft production was creative and self-driven. And in Shantinigadan, it was driven by collective taste and functionality. Shantinigadan, the objects made, as I said earlier, was exclusive and expressive, driven by goals of personal fulfillment and social recognition. Supported, and it supported a lot of ephemeral arts like alpana and making flower and leaf ornaments, etc and avoided carpentry. Srinika then focused on crafts that had greater market acceptance, textile, ceramics, and carpentry were given importance there. And the ephemeral things like Alpana had less, I mean, kind of importance there. In Shantanika then the personal design language and style was important. In Srinika then impersonal collective studio styles were developed. In Shantaniketan, the work of an artist would be stylistically unified. Now, stylistically, the products of Sriniketan was eclectic. It borrowed things or motifs or designs from American Indian art, Scandinavian folk traditions, classical Indian art, Japanese, Indonesian, etc. So it went across, it was actually more cross-cultural in terms of sourcing of motifs and so on. In Shantaniketan, they encourage innovation in a sense, because it was more individualized and move from one individual object to the other. Whereas in Srinigadan, it adopted and standardized. The motives in Shantanigadan were derived from nature study. In Srinigadan, a lot of motives were geometric, especially in woven textiles, organic, nature-based motifs were limited to batik and leather batik works. Where, I mean, people like Radhintal Nath, I mean, uh, Gauri Banja, et cetera, were more involved. Most individual studio production, I mean, Shantani and artists who became artists, designers, went into studio production. They made handcrafted objects, which were closely uh, related to fine arts production, and economically are more valuable. Whereas in Sriniketan, the projects were mass produced anonymously by hand for economic reasons too. And this is where Sriniketan actually differs a great deal from Bauhaus because we had this whole battery of uh, rural craftsmen or people who could be turned into rural craftsmen and there was cheap labor, and that was utilized for mass production rather than industrial production. So you can see these different goals which they had. So the goals were, if you look back, promotion of non-professional craft practices that is allied goals in Shantanikaran. Besides teaching students, art students, it also had allied goals. So it was to create, promote non-professional craft practice. That was one of the goals of Shantini Ketan. In Srini Ketan, it was educating trainers for rural activities or rural reconstruction later as the school we saw. Now, it founded for promoting these non-professional craft, it founded institutions like Padu Sankar in 1929 in Shantini Ketan, which encouraged non-artists and especially women to take up informal craft practices. And Shantini Ketan, through all these try to create a middle class with a new aesthetic taste. And amateur practice of arts and crafts like alpana, batik, embroidery, et cetera, flourished during this period. In Srinikadan, as we already saw that it was focusing on training craft workers. And you know that the boys who were trained and girls, of course, come in a little later, who were trained in these crafts, um, they were kind of 
trained in the sloid system, which we talked about, and therefore woodwork and weaving were important for them. They created artisans and the artisan trainers to meet the new aesthetic demand, which was actually generated through the activists. The middle class taste was generated by Kalabhavan, and that taste was, I mean, kind of, I mean, met or objects uh, that corresponded to that taste was produced in Srinagar. The creation of a group of educated workers from among the rural population. That was the other aim of Srinagar. So you had, besides the main goals, you also had allied uh, goals for these two uh, institutions, which are different. So if you look briefly at the achievements to end this thing, uh, in Shantiniketan, craft was made a supplementary practice for artists and created, as I said, bodies like Kaju Shamgo. And also that was meant for, initially it was meant for students and students who had passed out of Kalabon to earn a living if they couldn't do it by selling works. So that was the purpose, one of the parts that uh, Shantiniketan or Kalabon played. And as I said, the cultivation of particular taste, shaping of an urban middle class lifestyle. That was the other aspect of the Kalabon project. Now, and create a receptive class, a large car, receptive class amongst the middle class by popularizing craft practices and a creation of non-professional practitioners for that as well, because they were the actual people who kind of make this demand sustainable. In Srinagar, it was meant to make objects of daily use rather than luxury goods, uh, or objects that were meant for collection. And it played a role in meeting the demands of this middle class, as I said, and the hand production method was also seen as an alternative to mechanical production. It created, most importantly, a class of non-traditional, non-caste-based professional artisans. And that's an important thing. In 1947, for instance, we have, in the beginning when the whole institution was starting, I mean, it was, difficult to get people from outside a caste to practice a particular craft. So it will be only moochies coming from to learn tannery. It will be only weavers coming to do weaving. But by 1947, there were 36 caste workers in leather work, and there were 223 people from other caste doing leather work. In weaving, there were 96 cast weavers and there were 58 non-cast weavers. In carpentry, there were seven traditional carpenters and 21 people from other caste. In pottery, there were two potters from the potter caste and there were 32 potters from outside this thing. Now, I think this is pretty impressive even if everything else failed, this social transformation is something that we should take note of. Now, in Shantini, and of course, it produced versatile artists like Nandalal, Vinod Bihari, Ram Kinkar, Sutramanian, Ray, and A. Ramachandran, and so on. It produced a whole array of studio artist craftsmen like Devi Prasad, Kripal Singh, Ira Choudhury, Nirmala Patwatan, Meera Dhar, Sukumari Roy, Gauri Bancho, Jamina Sen, Chitraneva Choudhury, Indu Sudha Ghosh, and so on. Now, there were also people who took these crafts to art kind of thing to a higher level, like we said about Ritin Majumdar, on whom you had a separate session. Then, of course, Subramanian played a big role in bringing this interaction in the post-independent uh, India. And Hariharan, as I said, uh, was... Uh, involved in establishing some of these institutes. So I finished with the paper. If you give me five to 10 minutes, I will show you the few slides. Okay. 
Okay, so I hope it's visible now. What yes, I'm sure trying to show you yes. is very a little visual journey through Sriniketan. This is when the whole project is starting. You can see the little boys are clearing up the thing for the farms, and uh, Elmers was there at that point. This is an early photograph of the the Shikashatra. I mean, boys sitting and learning spinning, and um, you can see the looms are there. They are doing carpentry. Um, and you can see some of the products which they produce, the lac work and the toys which are there on the shelves, and the weavers who initially was doing entirely hand loom. Then we have the uh, looms, uh, the Swedish looms, and then the semi automatic looms, which was brought from Japan. And of course, this is a later one where, I mean, 40s, when they tried to make various ceramic objects much later. And of course, they are making various decorative objects which would be sold and you can see could be one of those um, in Calabon trained artists who is doing making this work. And this is the catalog we have from 1933-34 of the handicrafts. Now you can see a number of things are being done. These are the, in fact, certain things which we don't see in recent Sriniketan at all, like the dari, the carpets, for instance. This was, I mean, quite visible even when I first came, I would see a few examples of these, but now I think there is just one or two left. And uh, it was making various kinds of other kinds of things, bathic objects, and uh, it was making shawls, it was, making things for dress material, embroidered, uh, things for pelmet, so how it is now creating a certain kind of taste, urban taste, and uh, I mean, catering to that. Okay. Now, this is examples of the leather work and the leather objects that were being done. And we know that this continues even today, and uh, which is, mass produced around Shantaniketan quite a bit. So leather work is something that has actually continued a great deal. Now the book binding things, and there were all kinds of book binding they did from very simple ones to very complex and so on. And the lacquer work, various decorative objects which they produce. Now there was also some amount of jewelry making and furniture making as I said. So this is the catalog which they produced. Now, an old photograph like this, you can see many of the objects that Sri Negadan produced. The furniture, the carpet, the textile, you can see this wonderful batik, which is so close to the, in detailing, it's much closer to the Java batik, which is spread on the seat on which Tagore is sitting. And the various other objects in the thing, including some of those leather objects, the various other objects you can see here. This is all being created there. And in fact, today, the only old carpet we have is in, I mean, in Uttarayan, in the same room where we saw Prabhupada's sitting, that is the only carpet that remains from that period. And many of the objects that were, which I saw that even in 1974, when I first came, they have sort of disappeared and they're not produced anymore. So you can see the decline that happened somewhere in the 40s was completely total as we go along. Now, because, uh, I mean, and unfortunately, we haven't kept a record of what was produced. So that we don't have an archive of these objects, which is a shame. Maybe we can have some kind of archive, we can create an archive of furnitures designed in Shantaniketan, but all the other things, textiles especially, is almost totally lost. And the quality has now declined so much. Now, it would be totally misleading to think that these were the kind of things that Shantanigan produced in its early years. So that is it. Uh, that was an amazing learning experience. Uh, the amount of 
of detailed information that we were, you know, uh, exposed to. It was really a feast of that kind of detail of curriculum, activity, details of studentship, commissions, and travels that has really opened up um, a very, very important ground for thinking about uh, what is at the heart of this symposium. Uh, the arts crafts continuum, but as, and I will here take off from really the concluding section where uh, you very uh, pointedly juxtapose the two concurrent collaborative institutions, but their very different purpose, function, and impact. Right? Now, let me use that as a point of beginning uh, to ask actually a set of questions. And I know that Professor Ashok Chatterjee also has a fairly long comment and question. So maybe after my question, I'll also read that out and maybe you can take them together and then we'll open it up further. Now, the question of design, uh, which we know belongs as much to the fine arts as to the domain of what we may call decorative arts and crafts, uh, is something that is running through the material that you presented us with, running through the narrative that you're presenting us with, but you very pointedly did not refer to design and the figure of the designer, though you did talk of artist designer uh, coming up, artist craftsman coming up, artist designer coming up. Somewhere the question of design is implicit, but not foregrounded. And I was wondering whether you could reflect on the ways in which both Kalabhavan and units like Vichitra and Kalushanko, which are located within uh, Shantaniketan proper, and the new ventures of Shilpa Shadon and Shikha Shatro. Uh, somewhere, the, a new vocation of modern crafts as you are calling it. And that's a very, very important point you make that by the 40s, you have the emergence of a non-caste, non-heredity, perhaps group of artisans who are emerging as craft practitioners, right? So that's a very important break with earlier, say the colonial mode of training, which is continuously referring you to the bona fide artisan and that heredity of training and lineage. So here you're actually dealing with a break. But so I would just pose the question about uh, where design or an element of design uh, as something that belongs both to Kalabhavan and to Sriniketan, both to the artist, modern artist, and the modern craftsman. Is it possible to think of where we bring in design? It's not an easy insertion, but it seems both an insertion that is calling, calling out for us to think about. So that is one question. The other related question would be that given the directions in which Sriniketan moves, rural reconstruction, empowerment, market and livelihood, we could think of as categories that belong as much to the vocation of the artist as to the craftsman, right? In different ways, uh, livelihood and the question of marketing, uh, whether overtly or through other directions, commissions and all, must be something that I would like to think belongs not just to the domain of craft, but perhaps equally to the domain of the fine arts, that what you do with the training, what will be the earning and the occupational kind of hazards, the livelihood question. Now, if the artist designer becomes an important figure to emerge from Kala Bhavan, uh, why did the craftist, craftsman as designer not have the same opening? So, or did it? Is it something that we are not aware of? Are figures like Lokeshwar Shingho and others perhaps fulfilling a role which we would not have been called designers then, but may have come close to that kind of occupation? And so this really is, and the final question I have 
is with the images that you showed us, which is the complex of Uttarayana, where it seems that that one single photograph of Gurudev sitting in uh, Udayan opens up a whole domain of furniture and craft. And brings into the scenario two critical figures, one of whom you briefly referred to, both of whom you briefly referred to, which is Shurendranath Kaur and Rothindranath Tagore. I think Rothindranath and Shurendranath here act as a very important bridge in thinking about, of course, one, the artist as designer, and in the other case, a rural reconstructionist like Rothindranath, trained in the agricultural sciences, who ultimately emerges as a pioneer designer of furniture and others. Uh, I was wondering whether Udayan could not be thought of, or Uttarayan could not be thought of as a new site for design experiments in architecture, in craft, in interior decoration. Uh, you know, very much as public art is exploding around, you know, the Shantiniketan complex. These are major experiments, I would say, not just in public art or public craft, but in a, in a kind of aesthetic designing of the entire environment. So that is a comment perhaps that I was thinking whether uh, that the roles of these figures, because Shurindranath is not a trained architect, but he becomes a person who lends design to architecture. And Rothindranath perhaps had he stayed on in Shantiniketan, may have had a very different vision for Shantiniketan. I mean, that's a sense that I've always had that more than Pratima Devi, which was of course very important. It was Rathindranath who would have perhaps steered and somebody who consciously sees himself as not an artist, a writer, a designer, maker of furniture, extremely talented individual, but who somewhere stands apart from that identity of being an artist. I mean, he is many things. So you, you can choose not to address any of these or some of these. Would you like me to also read out Ashok Chatterjee's uh, comment or would you like to respond to these first and then I'll read that out? Let me respond to you first because otherwise I'll forget how. Sure. sure. Okay. So there are so many questions there. I mean, all very important. Um, yeah, Shantiniketan, in fact, did various things and didn't do certain things. So this is a problem. So the, the, the idea of uh, kind of bringing about this economic upliftment, that part was, I think, something that really figured more importantly in Srinikitan. And therefore, none of these people, many of these people who worked were farmers who were using their non-agricultural time for production. So they were not actually craft artisans in that sense, like traditional artisans. They actually became craft workers. So there is a little problem there. I mean, when we think about it, so that's why always we hear that the designs are provided, the material is provided. So they are taught a particular skill, craft skill, which then they apply and produce objects. So that really didn't give them, give them enough opportunity to grow as artists or designers. Whereas in Shantaniketan, the training allowed them and the term, usually you find that these uh, documents using is decorative arts. It doesn't say craft so much. It doesn't say uh, design. These are the words that we bring in. But most of the time they use it as decorative words. And the general attitude that the, the Shantanika, the artist had towards it from Nandalal down to Subramanian, they saw this art craft thing as a continuum and design as a part of it. Because art and design, all of this for him was, for them were different kinds of communication methods, visual communication. So they came under the visual communication. So the normal way we think about it as art has 
something hierarchically much higher, the crafts as something lower or kind of thing. That was not so strong for these people. I mean, you will probably see a lot of the work they do, did was called, or we will call them as art rather than crafts or kind of thing. But they saw this whole continuum as different forms of visual communication. So that was their way of conceptualizing this. So they didn't use the separate terms like artists, designers, craftsmen, as we tend to do. So that was the other thing. Now, the most important thing I saw was there was a non-cast craft producer, I mean, skilled craft producer emerging out of Sriniketan, but not somebody who really became a designer. The only person who was, as you suggested, was Lakshmeshwar Singha, who actually didn't study in Kalabu. He was, I mean, he came from what is now Bangladesh, and already he had an interest, he had studied carpentry as an young boy. And then when he gets to Calcutta to, for higher education, he's completely kind of, I mean, out of place there. He visits Shantini Ketan, hears about it, comes to Srini Ketan, meets Elmer's, mm -hmm. and then decides this is the kind of place I want to be in. So he enrolls, he studies there, and then he becomes a teacher. In fact, he is the kind of, in fact, the last photograph which I showed that inlaid work on that little table, corner of the table we saw was perhaps by him. He was a good expert in this and probably he had an influence on someone like Ritin Majumdar. The first time I heard of Lakshmeshwar Sinha was from Ritin Majumdar. So, so there was probably somebody like Lakshmeshwar Sinha who did make an impact on others. And who could have emerged as a designer, but because of his many interests, including, I mean, Esperanto, for which he spent a lot of time. I mean, he didn't really kind of organize these things. He was more a teacher, whether it was in, in his association with Gandhi or whether later he was associated with the Vinaya Bhavan, the Teachers Training Institute. So his role in Shantani Kenan was totally as a teacher. So he didn't really, emerge as the designer figure who could have been one person came. Now, the others who you refer to, Radhi Nath and Shurendra Nathka, definitely were people who were kind of, in fact, even in the Kalabon syllabus, that architectural drawing was probably because of Shurendra Nathka. So you can see that the, the talents of the teachers are also reflected in the syllabus and the changes that we see in the things. Pradyantanath, actually, I wanted to bring in some of his work. In fact, also just the, the tools that he used, for instance. I mean, there's a large collection of tools, and he was very systematic. He had a whole collection of sample hoops and different kinds of hoops and what kind of vitamin and all that kind of stuff. So that needs a separate study in itself to bring him out as an artist craftsman kind of thing. And Udayan was something as a site, as you said, is a very interesting thing. And I was even thinking, and I was trying to photograph it, but you know, it's not easy to photograph that place. Access to that place is very limited even to us. So one of the last photographs that's was- that's true for you, you could imagine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like us, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that is something that I was telling them, in fact, the 100 years should be a time for creating an archives of Sri I mean, the craft thing, the art thing, we have done a bit. I mean, we have some idea of it. And the art things were all collected in museums and private collections, and we can study it. But this craft archive is much more difficult. And unfortunately, we don't have it in India. I mean, at least this part of India and about Shantani Ketan, very little has been done. So whatever is left there, I think should be studied. I was trying to photograph some of them, but I couldn't do enough. I have done a little bit, but not enough to show. And there was there itself was eclectic taste. This furniture, which I showed today, is of one kind. There are some old photographs. We don't see that furniture very much there, 
there's an old photograph where you can see the interior looks a bit like a post Bauhaus modern interior. I mean, this might have been the private rooms maybe of Radhizama. That's my hunch. So I think that's an interesting point that you then open yeah. up. That given that Sridi Keton never produced a museum, you know, like model crafts, like yeah, say the yeah. Victoria Technical Institute does, uh, you know, in Madras, and then you know, even we don't know what's happened to those pottery. So the idea was that they move into new marketing retailing units. They travel as exhibitions, but maybe it is Uttarayan which and many private homes may be and the photographs that you may get, which may now become the archive for thinking about yes. how Sriniketan products permeated middle class homes, consumption, you know, enters, creates a new kind of, I would say, creates crafts for modern living in a way that, you know, we talk about much later. Yes, that's right. Uh, let me read out the question. Pushmita, uh, would you like to come in now or later? I had a question, but let's read out uh, Professor Chatterjee's uh, observation and question as well. Are you reading it out, Kapitidhi? I an import, a most important contribution to our understanding of India's design movement and the seminal role of Gurudev's institutions. It seems the tension that can and should exist between so-called creative and commercial aspects may have been beyond the capacities of those who placed art, craft, and design in silos. We did not hear about the extraordinary industrial design work done under Prashantha Roy and others. A real mystery remains. Why did Shantiniketan's pioneering understanding of design disappear? And I think this is a question that Ashok Chatterjee raised even in his opening talk about a potential for design training and practice that comes up but then disappears. Uh, what, was it a caste system between the so-called fine arts and so-called crafts uh, that despite achievements in drawing non-traditional candidates into craft practice, a hugely important achievement? Yeah, um, I, I'm not sure if there was that hierarchy was very strong. Uh, in Kalabon itself, it was left to the individuals. There are many people who didn't probably come out later and practice on a professional plane, but many of the students went into kind of uh, doing things. For instance, I've heard of people who were very good in toy making, for instance, and Nandala encouraged them to continue with those kinds of work. So there were people who did various things, but at a certain point in life, maybe because the market wasn't there, because especially women, after they left the institution, they kind of went back, proceeded. Some of them, as we saw, who moved into more urban spaces. I mean, they became studio portals and things like that. But others who continue to remain either in Shantiniketan or even in Calcutta, their work remained more of a private, I mean, practice within a very narrow space and gradually it sort of dried. So that is what we see. I mean, so many things would be kind of uh, thing, but there were, I mean, non-professionalism in a sense, was also one of the factors. It had its positive side, but it also had perhaps a negative side in the sense that it became a cultivation of oneself, one taste, and so on. And the other part of, I mean, spreading it or making it a much larger kind of creating platforms where it would be displayed and so on was not very important for many of these people. So that was, I think, one of the problems there. Of course, there will be a the tension between the creative and the marketing part. And that is always, I think, a problem, not only in Shantanikit and elsewhere. I mean, uh, so how do you balance 
the artist driven and the market driven i mean how do you bring about and uh, so maybe we can do it with a certain amount of i mean if you have sensitive people who can you know because one of the things that in many of my talks with manita for instance one of the problems he saw was that there wasn't like many of the the kind of people who are involved in promoting arts very often didn't understand what would be the linguistic basis of the craft production that a particular craftsman had where does its skill come from how can how much can you innovate it in which direction can it be innovated etc so they just i mean dropped a model which is totally alien to the skill set that the craftsman had or the uh, craftsman had so this is where things come this i mean in any traditional craft there should be a match between the skill set that the artisan has and the innovation that the market is suggest suggesting and if there is a match between these two things then it can be successful and also it should be functional some of the things we saw for instance the table which didn't work at all i mean i mean a kind of fancy designing itself would not do it also have to meet functional purposes as well as what the craftsman understand in terms of so unless all these things three things come together it wouldn't work and maybe many people involved in craft promotion doesn't think very much of it so i think that is the kind of thing so the designers especially who are not producing themselves i think should be more sensitive towards the skill set the craft people have the craft person has rather than just provide this thing that that's a very very pertinent point uh, uh, i had a kind of a rambling question and um, i would like you to uh, reflect upon you know how uh, the socio economic and the political a uh, framework of uh, if we can call it political but it is because it is talking about uh, you know crafts as a way of economic um, upliftment in a way so how does this socio economic and political uh, you know uh, vision of sri niketan connect to gandhi's more political act and also later to the nehruvian uh, you know agenda of the upliftment of the craft sector revivalism and also could you uh, connect it to uh, founding of the institutions such as nid because we do know the connections there gira you know, sarabhai had you know, studied here in shantiniketan so how do you see uh, the reflection of what was started here and how it changes and does it actually uh, you know pay the later uh, you know innovations do they find a connect or do they completely divorce from what had started here and is there also a reflection back here in the sriniketan shantiniketan model of what was happening um, outside okay and um, thank you for the question and uh, well i think that there was a greater connect between sri niketan and the gandhian project than in the later ones um obviously the same people were involved i mean uh, when the documentation of crafts was being planned by gandhi as i said uh, tagore himself wrote a note to him what should be done and what should be the way and andrews was constantly going between them carrying uh little bits of notes and details of conversations and there was nandalal and shudin kaur also involved and some of the others that like krishna shinda and uh, um also later of course not so much in shaping it but being part of it um devi prasad gupta so there was that conversation and many of the nationalist uh some of the others who took part in the craft revival later they did visit shantiniketan during those early days so maybe some of of it was there was a rub off of shantiniketan on 
the work that came later. But of course, the Nehruvian one, actually, I think Nehru himself was not directly involved. It was the more of the socialist within the Congress who took up these causes. So they, of course, had some links and uh, some early connections with Trent. Uh, so I think that those institutions definitely looked at Shantaniketan to an extent, but the time had changed, things had changed, even in Shantaniketan, because when it begins, I mean, Tagore and this institute is the main agent of change. So by after independence, Vishwabharati's role as an agent of change, even locally, decreases. So that is where the projects begin to become less effective. So there is also a limitation to what, since probably we had to reimagine, as some of the other people who now work with crafts has reimagined this whole process of how do you work with crafts people. So I think that reimagining was necessary. And post Tagore, post Nandalal, I mean, post even Rathiantan Nath to some extent, that ability to reimagine vanished. And I said, by becoming a central university, even the, the kind of impetus to try something went away. I mean, everybody became a wage earning professional and we were, I mean, most of the people and the production part of Srinikhe then actually went, the training part went away completely. To a certain extent, that was one of the big problems. So everybody wanted to, and also in the first year, they tried to give a diploma. Immediately they understood that was a mistake and closed it. But what eventually happened was that Srinikhe then started giving certificates and diplomas and then once people got those pieces of paper, then they were looking for jobs. Instead of becoming craftsmen or artisans or having their own work, they wanted to become, I mean, uh, job seekers. And that was one of the problems. And in fact, you can see from the late 40s onwards, I think if you look at Srinikhe, then this was one of the problems. On the, on the one side, in independent India, you had other government agencies which are looking after these issues and the influence of Shanti and decline. And Shantaniketan itself didn't remain as a training center primarily, which it could have. It tried for a little while. There was a training course meant for craftsmen, which actually ran till about 1970. When I first came, I think there was the last batch of people who came, craftsmen who came from different parts for I think six months or eight months or more. But all that gradually entered, the training program entered and it became a very localized production center. And also the aesthetic guidance, which was there, that also vanished. So there's certain quality of products, which we see earlier, that actually ticked. So these, all these things, uh, I kind of think it should have, it could have reinvented itself after 1947, but unfortunately that did happen. There's a question uh, from Suchitra, uh, and there's another in the Q&A. This is in the chat box, which in a way also touches on something that I also wanted to ask you. It says, could you please say a little about Chantaniketan artists, just such as KG Subramania? who went on to be a part of Weaver Service Centers. So I wanted to ask this question that in at the time of independence, Sriniketan is poised at, in a particularly important potential role that would be taken up by say the All India Handloom Boards, the regional design centers, the Viva service centers, right? So we have that kind of proliferation of these happening with figures like Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay and you know Ajit Ghosh, the promotion on a national level. Now, why? I mean, you do have an important explanation about a certain uh, falling away of vision and a failure to reinvent. 
are the two points you were saying that that kind of thing. But it's still, I think, begs the question about why the Sriniketon trained people or those artist designers who were so crucial for Sriniketon. Uh, how far, I mean, we know that KJ Subramaniam, but many other artists, you know, like even Mira Mukherjee is working for regional design centers and all. The fact that artists join these national institutions to promote craft and design. And Sriniketan, it seems, was extremely well poised to have pioneered that move into a national kind of more planning level. And maybe that's something to do with the new political economy that it didn't work. So, uh, but on Subramanya and the Weaver's service center. Yeah. See, <coughs> one of the things we should remember, and I was trying to make that the craft program was part of a larger program in Sri. It was meant to be, I mean, part of a uh, whole work in rural development. I mean, you can see after independence, this is kind of split. I mean, nobody takes up that kind of a thing. It is basically craft becomes a separate thing and you're dealing with traditional craftsmen. You're not so much dealing with villagers who become part-time artisans, but you're dealing with artisan communities and trying to find alternate venues for them, both creatively as well as for marketing. So that is slightly a different thing that happens in a sense. Now, there were people like Subramanian, of course, who took it quite seriously. But the unfortunate part of it is that his work with the Weaver Service Center is totally undocumented. He didn't have a single piece. I mean, he didn't have photographs. Although he did quite a lot of work, uh, the only documentation now survives is a kind of photograph in the New York Public Library of one of the works which has shown at the, uh, the 1964 World Trade Fair. Although there was a lot of work there, they were all sold away. And uh, so we don't know where they disappeared. And he, uh, since it was work that he did for the Weaver Service Center, he didn't document it. So I've tried to get hold of them, but even people who were associated with them at that time, they haven't done that. So it's not there. And only thing that I've seen is that he had a trunk full of sample pieces, which he did. There's a whole lot of it. And he once told me he wants to give it to our design department. But after his death, I couldn't find the trunk. I looked all over the department here. I put in find a piece. So unfortunately, uh, those days, photographing was expensive and somehow I missed photographing them. So, and also my interest was more in uh, the art part. Uh, so I missed the entire thing. So there are these things which I think, for he was an interesting person, both in terms of the work he did I mean, who tried to bridge this difference and how to bring in, and also think about the whole issue of what to do. I mean, like many thoughts he had on crafts and artisans and all that, I think went beyond what the government institutions were trying to do. So in terms of thinking about these issues and how to address them, he had, I think, various interesting thoughts. I mean, how to make it flexible, not hold them to their traditional crafts. If they wanted to move out, how would they do? How would their next generations be trained? What would be the method of training? How should even schooling should be taking place? Where the, instead of the, their children going to schools, why not the schools reach out to them? Now, some of those issues, are, I mean, some of those ideas were radical because how to allow a craftsman to have that opportunity to branch out into other areas of or other professions if necessary, and how he could uh, educate himself or craftsmen's children edu edu educate themselves. So these were all issues, the larger issues. I think in a sense that is something, um, and all these things he gave thought to, but his own work 
in the area yeah, has not been documented, which was quite varied because he, he enjoyed, he learned working with the craftsmen. So he was not just designing motifs and things like that, which of course to do that, all the other artists also learned the basics, but he was also adopting the approaches to art production that some of these master craftsmen had. I mean, that is how were his innovations, whether it is in terracotta, in kind of glass painting, all this owes something to that. Even this idea of communication, I mean, that I talked about that all forms of art are different forms of communi visual communication rather than just hierarchies of crafts art and all that. That was something that came from working for the experience of working with uh, these highly skilled, highly talented professional artisans in at the Weber Service Center. So he also, in his own interaction with the craftsmen, he also encouraged them to use their creative thinking quite a bit. For instance, when he worked with uh, Garcilla Verma for you know, on his murals, he never worked in a medium which Garcilla Verma was, I mean, comfortable with. Because he didn't want Garcilla Verma's artisanal skill, but he wanted Garcilla Verma's innovative thinking, which he contributed to many of the murals. So various technical solutions to Subramanian's mural was actually provided by Garcia Lambert. So you, the way you look at an artisan, a traditional artist was quite different and which was, I think one of the interesting aspects of his work. But unfortunately that whole gamut was there that people and he didn't document any of his work till 80, when he was in Baroda, it was documented by Jodi Bhatt. And after he came to Shantanikaran, I did most of the documentation. So by himself, he didn't document. And the Bombay phase where he did most of these things, therefore went totally undocumented. So we can only speak about it from one or two pieces we have and uh, what we hear from people. There's a question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, I wonder whether it's the same or whether there are many anonymous attendees. I've always wondered uh, whether it's the same person. Uh, what was the attitude towards technology in Sriniketan? In the market-driven production, was there any debate between handmade mass production and scaling up using machines? Uh, which begin brings in the question of technique and technology in a new way. Yes. There was, I mean, Srinikadan was more open to uh, some amount of, I mean, I mean, mechanization. I mean, than Shantaniketan. Shantaniketan was entirely hand produced. And as I said, they produced studio artists. I mean, craftspeople who produced craft objects or whatever functional objects in studios as individual artists did. But in Sriniketan, for instance, those looms which came from Japan, they were semi-automatic kind of thing. So they used various ways. And also we see that uh, some other equipments which is necessary for making craft objects or making certain kind of things were employed. So it is not that as if they were strictly I mean, hand loom or strictly kind of thing. Part of it could be, I mean, missions driven things. So that was possible. It was not averse to using missions, but although by and large, it was kind of thing. And also the whole idea was that you had a large number of people in the villages who have to earn something and who could be trained to do certain kind of craft practice. So that was also a issue. So we couldn't think about just scaling up using missions. I mean, wherever it was necessary, missions were used in Sriniketan, unlike in Shantaniketan. And I mean, Shantaniketan was a little more purist in that sense. Uh, and also probably it was not necessary you are making individual objects more than objects for reproduction. So uh, certainly Sriniketan was open to the idea. 
I mean, it was not heavily mechanized, no, at all, not at all, but small instruments which would help, I mean, speed up production was certainly employed. But not on a large scale because, as I said, most of the weavers were working from their own homes. I mean, there were only very few trainees working in Sriniketan. So since people were working in their own homes, so it has to be more handloom missions. Shiddha, could you, could you shed a little more light on uh, this shaping of the taste of the middle class? And you're talking about the 1920s and the 30s. I mean, you are talking about the pre-partition time. And how does this shaping of this middle class, uh, as we saw in some of the pictures that, and as you spoke, that it was not just in Bengal, but it, it was spread all across India. So how does it then... Um, translate in the post to the post partition world or translate with this stopping of uh, the production in Sriniketan and what happens uh, could you shed a little more light there yeah that's quite simple I mean I mean if you go anywhere in Bengal the middle class the so-called cultivated taste uh, say even in Calcutta is entirely based on what Shantaniketan was producing in terms of the color schemes, in terms of the materials, the love for certain kind of textiles, et cetera. And at some point, it had a market across, even in the South, it had a certain market. So that set the taste in certain things. In fact, you can see many of those things were reproduced. If you look at Gauri Bancho's kind of things, I thought of showing something, but I think I left out those things. I mean, some of the little ornaments she made, it's now being mass produced in the Shenibar and Hart. And uh, I mean, which is spreading across. So you can see many things, many kind of objects that were produced at that time has become the leather crafts of instance, which still has a big market kind of thing. And it's done and it is still helping a lot of people in Shantanagaran. I mean, although more than what Shantanagaran is producing, all the other units around Shrinikatan mm -hmm. They're producing much more and they are selling quite a bit and it's still sustaining uh, many villages around that area. So these objects did spread and what you think is a refined cultivated taste in many of these areas. I think they are based on the products that Shantarian made in the 30s and early 40s. You know, taking off from what uh, Ushmita just said, I think one of the lasting contributions perhaps uh, that I don't know about, certainly our generation and certainly our parental generation, was precisely this question of a certain economy of design in that case. So it's not opulence, it's simplicity mm -hmm. and economy. Mm -hmm. It invents a style of dress of the modern woman, right? Flowers in your hair, mm -hmm. a certain kind of shautali ornament, a certain yeah. shari. It becomes an, a certain way of designing the interior, drawing room, low furniture, a certain kind of seating. And I think that would be a very, very interesting thing to follow through into middle-class lifestyles and consumptions through the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And growing up in those years, I saw my parents had Chantaniketan backgrounds in greater and lesser ways. And that was such a distinctive mark of fashion as against other forms of fashion. More, you could say more Western styles, more eclectic styles. So that to me becomes, again, a very interesting way to think about a design aesthetic, not just art and craft, but a design aesthetic that spreads and becomes middle class values, a, set, a lifestyle of fashion. Yeah. And that is what you can bring up one, uh, particularly the life of two Shantaniketan modern crafts, uh, which have perhaps older tradition. One is batik, leather batik, leather batik in particular, but also batik in terms of the way it goes into textiles, and the other being the floral product, right? So both have maybe other pasts. 
but they have a Shantiniketan branding to it, right? In the form, and it's not Rangoli, it's not of that. And we see its impact in Bangladesh today, where Alpuna has become this secular form that is there in all public places. So I think we can think of the Shantiniketan design aesthetic in all these ways, you know, without going into whether the figure of the designer or whether design training emerges. I would say as a curated space, as a, there's a design aesthetic that is so strong. And maybe it affects certain kinds of craft products. And, and ensures a very much more durability to them uh, than perhaps even the institutional space. And the fact that today you have figures that should be, I think his name is Shudhi Ranjan Mukherjee, no? who excels in the art of Alpona and has carried it to new kinds of levels, that there's a way in which certain branding, I know that term may not suit Chantiniketan, but Chantiniketan does do of kind of branding of design aesthetic and a certain craft I, I would uh, sorry if, if I can add something to what Dapatidi said and you know I was actually thinking more of furniture and how the Sloyd system brings in this you know Swedish influence but then also later you have the Um school and the Bauhaus and also you have the Far Eastern traditions in Shantiniki so I was actually thinking in how uh, you know, this moment translates and connects to all the other moments of uh, influences that do come in at a later stage. And uh, maybe that was what I was asking you to kind of reflect on. Yeah, I mean, it's true. As Tapati was saying, I think there was uh, this creation of the middle class taste. Nantalal actually played a big role. That's why all those non-professional practices in the community was very important. Because Shantaniketan, as I've tried to argue elsewhere, was also an uh, exercise in community building. And because all of that was happening, the education, the Srinagatan project, everything were part of a larger program of community building. And both Rabindranath and Nantalal recognized that without having a substantial number of people in the community who practice arts at a certain level, maybe non-professional, may not be highly skilled, without that, you cannot sustain a certain artistic practice for long, especially a kind of, I mean, aesthetics of functional arts cannot be sustained without having that. And creating that community was one of the things that Nandalal did. So, uh, of course, and then that community spread, as Tapati was saying, like her parents who came and st stayed here for some time, then goes back to Calcutta. So that kind of took this, I mean, it spread across India because there were students coming from other, across India. So they took back this aesthetics back into their places. I mean, so that was an important thing. So creating a community which has a certain kind of refined taste, uh, which is not too loud, which is uh, still aesthetically kind of uh, refined and so on. And that was, I think, an important thing. Now, the, uh, the kind of furniture thing is true. There was this thing which I said, because I think on the whole kind of thing, the role of Lakshmeshwar Sinha is something which is completely left out. I mean, hardly anybody remembers him in Shantaniketan. I haven't heard him being spoken except by Rizinda. I mean, so in a sense- Pictures from a, a student's thesis on Sriniketan. Yeah, I, she never yeah. published, yeah. So I got to know about Shikha Shatra and Lokisha Sinha largely yeah. through her work, yeah. yeah. Yeah, although there are two books written by him. I mean, one in Bengali and one in English besides the guide that he wrote. So there are, he was also one of those articulate early teachers who was kind of, so outside Kalabar. So in the sense like uh, some of these things, he also tried to do a institute, similar institute uh, in his own, I mean, village later, which didn't run. So he came back and after leaving Gandhi, he went there and tried that. Then he came back to Shantiniket and became a teacher in the Vinayabhan. Um, but, 
So there are a lot of these figures who might have to be rediscovered. I mean, who have not been documented, who have been thinking, and then we will probably see more of these linkages emerging. Because we haven't studied even Ruthie Tilma. I mean, then all these other figures are there. So, so that is some, something that needs to be taken. And I'm sure there will be, we will be much better informed if somebody really pays some attention and tries to understand and record the work of these people. Would you like to read up the last that's there in the q and Yes, um, this is from Tanya Talwar. Um, she thanks us for arranging this session. And this is something I have struggled to establish, she says, when it comes to understanding the constituent students and syllabus at these schools from the very start. Can you provide when does women start entering the art schools, be it at the colonial industrial art schools, Shantaniketan or Sriniketan? What does this change? Does the entry of women students also start the teaching of subjects such as embroidery? What kind of embroideries are being taught here? Lastly, can you talk a little bit about the markets? Who were the consumers of the objects that were being created? Is it a middle class Bhadralok consumer? Or does the market go beyond national borders too? Um, well, uh, there were girl students right from the beginning. Even probably in 1921, when it started, there were girl students. I think there were six boys and six girls at that time. So, I mean, there were girl students, at least as far as Calabon is concerned. And if you go through the uh, record of old students, you can see there was a fairly large number of girl students coming from different parts of India. A couple of names I've taken who became famous later. There were others who worked in other areas and made their name. Uh, for themselves. And so girl students were not lacking in uh, kind of thing, at least uh, compared to other uh, art schools, I think there were more girl students in Kalabon right from the beginning. But in many other parts of India, girl students entered the art school a little later and some places much later. I mean, especially in the South, I mean, the girl students entered the art colleges very, very late. So that varies kind of thing. Now, one of the interesting things about Shantini Ketan was that this division between uh, girls doing crafts and boys doing other kinds of art, that was not really there very much. I mean, there were men who went into and became designers, craftsmen, et cetera. There were women who, I mean, preferred to become painters or sculptors or things like that. Now, as I said later, of course, when they left the art college, how much did they become professional artists? That's a different question. There it was, I mean, things went beyond the institutional framework and the social systems takeover. I mean, also in many other cases, I mean, like we know of writers, I mean, the Hindi writer Shivani, who actually came to Shantanigadan and became a very good singer. And she wanted to pursue a career in music. The day she was married, her father-in-law told her that nobody earns in this house singing. That's the end of her career as a musician. She emerges as a writer of this state. So you can see that there were, I mean, everything doesn't depend upon, I mean, the institution. Some of it actually how men and women practice these arts actually also depends on the social conditions in which they live. So as an institution, it didn't make him. We have uh, Ram Kinker, who is the, I mean, if you think the machos artist in India doing batik. We have photographs of him doing alpana. So that was kind of thing. Nandalal obviously did, I mean, batik saris and things like that. Everybody did that. You have uh, some reference to uh, kind of Vinod Bihari doing textiles, uh, especially in the 50s. So this division 
didn't really exist very much. I mean, some of them individually excelled in different crafts. I mean, sometimes they were men, sometimes they were women, kind of thing. So within the institutional framework, it was not very hierarchical. And the whole thrust of Nandalal was that what you were good in, you could go and do that. I mean, until much later, the division between almost till about 90, late 1950s, the division into different disciplines was not very important. So students who are working together would specialize in different areas. And it didn't matter whether they worked in one area or the other very much. I think. So that freedom was there. So I think those were not things. They did all kinds of things, batik and various kinds of dyeing techniques, bantani and so on and so forth. That was commonly practiced. And embroidery was there, obviously. And there is a whole tradition of embroidery, traditional embroidery in Bengal. So that was definitely there. And in the initial stages, of course, almost everybody had to do that. As I said, that the crafts, there's a list of crafts, even after 30s, each student had to do three crafts, although when there was some choice. So that was there. Even as a student in the beginning, we were forced to do batik and things like that. So it was not that, I mean, we didn't do that. So even, uh, it is still there a little bit, but maybe not to that extent. So, I mean, I did pottery, because as art historians, we are supposed to go into all the things, more than the practicing students. So I went to Srinagar and did pottery with Devi Prasad Gupta and uh, Shanko Chaudhary. They were both visiting fellows at that time. So I went and had classes with them. I had classes in textile weaving with Srinivasan, who was the head of the textile sect at that time with some of the other people there. So, I mean, that was the thing. And even look at that syllabus in art history. It was much wider than what we have today. I mean, in a sense. So, uh, in fact, that openness was there in almost everything and one could choose. Uh, and one was also compelled to do a little more. I mean, uh, for varied things in those early days. There's one, questions? there's one last question. This I think we'll take this as the last question for the evening. This is Aziz Sharafi. And he asks, on reflecting back, how much can contemporary and upcoming technology play a role in reinventing the design in India? Are there attempts to do that? The whole world of design will be impacted by these upcoming new areas in design. Are the design schools adapting to it? Yeah, I think that is what uh, one would naturally do. The problem is that uh, when the teachers become little rigid, otherwise, if you think about uh, the whole uh, education as training in visual communication, if you take that attitude, then the new technologies doesn't matter. They're all welcome. I mean, so, how we define, I mean, what we are trying to do as educators, where we are trying to teach a particular thing, I mean, way of doing things, or whether we are trying to train people in a larger kind of project, that is visual communication, then many things can be overcome. And I think one of the great things of Nandalal's approach was, I think, the way he used human resources. The kind of schools we have today, we waste a lot of human resources. I mean, you get into art school, you join as a painter. Suppose you discover you can't be a good painter, you've wasted your five years and you don't know what to do. You will get a certificate in painting where you have bad marks and you don't do anything. But the flexibility as an institute that Nandalal brought in where one could go into an area which was uh, of interest to one, which where one had natural talent 
and you could develop in any of these areas was the best kind of thing you could do in such a situation where we had very little resources. So he valued all kinds of human resources in which technology then becomes a small part. And if you take such an approach, then new technologies are always welcome. I mean, I think if you think about it, not as studying a particular art form, but trying to make yourself a good communicator in the visual arts, then probably the question of technology is old or new doesn't really matter. Thank you so much, uh, Shivda, for a brilliant and illuminating lecture. Uh, and I think uh, you know, there's a proposal for students or scholars here. Uh, Shivda has uh, shown some areas that need scholarship. Uh, and I think more students who are uh, studying here should look into these areas uh, and try and create more discourse around these hidden areas and artists and artisans. Tapati thank you so much for your observations and questions. Would you like to say something before we wrap up for today? I just want to thank my remembering a young faculty member who was very and you know, in my many conversations, looking at the history of modern stuff, design, uh, using the DNA and all that, the planet lost to the archive. It's part of it. So I just want to be my my session not just for the talk but for engaging with people. And I think that's been the mark of this seminar, not the body that it's this engagement that we are having. And I'm hoping we can bring you on board a final session for the speakers brainstorm of different about whether come up Thank you once again and for all our uh, kind of listeners, there's still 25 participants here for staying on for a full two hours on a Sunday evening. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe, Kuchmita, you can announce the next session. Yes. Um, so, the, our, the last two sessions of uh, this symposium series are scheduled for 27th March Sunday and 28th March Monday. We have Mortimer Chatterjee uh, on to the 20th. Uh, no, it's Sunday, Sunday and Monday. Saturday and Monday. Uh, no, it was changed. Yes, I think uh, an email was sent out. Maybe, you know, we'll have it sent out again. So, uh, 27th March, Sunday, Mortimer Chatterjee, and 28th March, Monday, Vishal Kandilwal. We hope to see you back then. Um, thank you so much, Shivda and Tapatidi. Yeah. Have a very good evening. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, both of you, and especially Taupati, because for pulling me into this project, because I was extremely reluctant to look at Srinigatan, and you forced me to take a look at that. And also, uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, we have to digress. Not all, nonetheless, is a very, very important topic. And I hope it will be a particular interest. Just like you told us about after somebody does work, and the future of Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.